welcome to the archive, Kevin, or as you are known as History Squad. Yep. <laughs> and you have your lovely canine companion with you. Yeah, little Rupert here. Yep, Rupert. He gets to join the archive as well today. Good morning, <laughs> Rupert. All right, so uh, on uh, your channel, His uh, History Squad, um, which I absolutely love the costumes and I love the props <laughs> and I love yeah. how into character you get. My my personal favorite is probably uh, the medieval doctor uh, <laughs> doing the arrowhead removal of Henry V. <laughs> well, I got to, I done a that, that was for Cambridge University. That was there was a series of films I did for them, and uh, when it came to that one, I was really tired and fed up as well, and. Yeah. Uh, the, the producer there says, just let go, Kev, just have some fun and just enjoy. And that's exactly what I did. And as the result was that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And by popular demand, 15 years later, I've done another one to carry on the the, the, the subject, you know, of uh, the wounds and that kind of thing. Wounds, yeah. Medieval surgery. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's great. I, I love it. Like when you're into it and you're like, now, here we're going <laughs> to... But today we're going to talk about uh, World War One, um, and even though you're British, uh, you are in Canada, and I'm curious to learn a little bit about Canada's involvement for World War One. Well, it's it's a bit of a an odd one because on the surface Canada embraces its history, but when you dig a little bit, people don't know very much. I belong to the local uh, Canadian Legion because I served with and alongside the Canadian forces, I'm classed as a, as a veteran here as well. And so, and I also uh, volunteer at a local military museum and you get people coming along and there is this stereotypical idea of the First World War where everybody stood in trenches, they then got up and charged forward and machine gunned down and, and it, that's what it was. Um, it's, Trying to, to 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 say to people, hey, do, do you know about the real battle for the battle for Vimy Ridge, for instance, which was part of a massive offensive in April 1917? And they go, well, that's where the Canadians won. I said, well, it goes deeper than that. I said, did you know about the tunnels going underneath Vimy Ridge? Miles of tunnels that the Canadians were able to get their troops into. So they couldn't, the enemy couldn't see the buildup. Did you see about the new plan that the Canadians had? about doing this, that, and the other, and operating as a, a Canadian unit. And they look at you with a, a total blank, and you think, okay, you're going too deep. So you start off with a very simple thing. And I've, I've got an artifact here for you. And this is my favourite artifact. And people go, really? This is just one, right? That's a cup, a British Army or a Canadian Army cup picked up in no man's land. And was that near Vimy Ridge? No, that was on the Somme. Uh, yeah, the spoon you found. That's right. And it's been well used. It's got an X where somebody's, you know, just put X, that's there. You can just about see it. This was literally sticking up out of the dirt um, alongside a place called Newfoundland Park. And that ground was fought over for five months. And every year, the farmers, they scarify these fields with, 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 the, with the rakes to get the stones up, ready for the winter plough, yeah? So September, October, the crops are in, they're doing that scarifying. But he, the farmer, he has one eye on the front and one eye on the back. Under his tractor, he, he has a belly plate, a steel belly plate, half inch thick. That's for explosives. Hanging next to him, is a modern gas respirator in case he knocks the top off a gas a gas shell. But what he's watching for is not just the shells, he's watching for things. And when they've finished their run, if they've picked up a rifle, if they've picked up a, a steel helmet, they're just put to one side. What they're looking for is bones. And these farmers have a harvest every year of, of it must be a sack of bones thigh bones jaw bones side of a skull whatever and uh, 
you can't do anything with these. You can't say, hey, we found a body because they are fragments of men who this this is the remains of those who've been blown to pieces or as they lie dead or dying in no man's land, they're blown to pieces again. Yeah. And so the farmers gather them up and they make a funeral pyre out of them. And then in November, that funeral pyre is lit. The bones are reduced to ashes and they're sprinkled on the cemetery that's right on the top of Hawthorne Ridge on the Somme. And Hawthorne Ridge and all the way along there is, you know, you can you can say, oh, yeah, it was a British offensive. Actually, it was Newfoundlanders who weren't Canadian in those days. And it was British. But afterwards, it was Canadian and British. And you go to the cemeteries there and some of them, you cannot differentiate between Canadian, British, South African. Yeah, all these different peoples are there. and trying to explain to people that hey it wasn't a case of the canadians just charged at vimy ridge the canadians were intermingled with everybody else and fighting with everybody else but they were their own army yeah they it was purely canadian but my uh ancestors were split they fought for the british and they well, fought with the british and they fought with the canadians too on vimy ridge um i think there were three of my ancestors were lost and they have no known grave, and and this this was a kind of an eye opener for your your readers, uh, your your viewers might understand this, or it might come as a shock. I used to take school groups to Berlin. I was stationed in Berlin in the Cold War, and there's a cemetery at the back of Berlin, on Heerstrasse. There are British Commonwealth War graves. It is, and it's there are three thousand bomber crew there, plus about six hundred murdered prisoners of war, and. Amongst the prisoners of war, there are troops from India. These guys were captured in Italy, ended up as prisoners of war in Germany, ended up being killed on the, the retreat to Berlin. But the bomber crew, 3,000 bomber crew. So I take the kids out there and I've got my blazer on and my red berry and all this kind of stuff, you know, to try and make it a little bit more business-like. And uh, I send them out. I said, now, look, they're buried in their bomber crew. And this young girl says to me, what do you mean, bomber crew? I said, well, if you look, this guy here is the pilot. This guy here is the observer. Here's the bomber. Here's the mid gunner. Here's the tail gunner. You've got seven in the Lancaster crew kind of thing. And this girl's going, are you telling me that they're actually down there? I said, what do you mean? She says, are you telling me that under each one of these white stones, there is a body of a, of a soldier or an airman? Yeah. And she put her hand on her mouth there. And then her friends are gathering around. I said, it's a cemetery. And they looked at me and they said, we thought it was a memorial, a representation of those who'd been killed. And it, it kind of really woke me up. So I've taken kids over the psalm. I've taken them to, to what we call Passchendaele. And I've shown them the cemeteries. And I've shown them where my ancestors are buried, so, you know, because I've, I've located a few graves. And you then try to tell, look, look, this guy here, he was somebody's father. Yeah, you see this guy here, he was somebody's only son because of the inscription underneath. And this is what people often miss now because it's over 100 years ago. They miss the fact that this guy who lost his spoon, yeah, was, was somebody's son. Um, to me, it matters, you know, that, that I look after it and I tell the story. You know, and people say, well, was he Canadian? Was he British? We don't know who he was. You know, the area where this was found, he was probably just blown to pieces. But uh, so that's kind of one of my crusades with my films is I try and humanise everything. I try and bring it down to a basic fact that, uh, hey, these guys were real or these women were real. Yeah. And that's part of the goal, too, here is to yeah. not just talk about history, but also to talk about that there were people as real as you and me. Yeah, well, you, you got one of the questions that uh, we've got is the a World War One mess tin, okay? So this is a First World War mess tin. And uh, there's the cut part there. But when you open it up and you find the guy's sewing kit inside <laughs> and you kind of go, really? And then the first time I opened this, I realised 
it had not been opened since the First World War. So it's got the correct thread for the uniforms and the correct needles and safety pins that don't match. But something so personal as, as that so many modern people don't even see his thimble. Mm -hmm. So some soldier had his kit. He kept it. He sewed up his socks, his uniform when it was torn. And uh, after the war, when he handed in his mess tin, he must have forgotten that this was in there. And uh, now it's part of my collection. Yeah. And I look after it. But it's amazing what is out there. I mean, this, this is a silly thing. It's a bar of Australian sunlight soap that was found in a German dugout in, in uh, Belgium near near uh, Passchendaele, in fact, not far from it. It's unopened. It still smells just a little bit of, of soap. But the, Ger the, the German soldier must have found this when he was attacking the, the allies, you know, the, the Australian trenches, and he's brought some back or whatever, and... Uh, but he never got to use it. And a simple thing like, you know, a bar of soap, because people forget that if you're in the trenches, you've got to do your best to keep keep yourself clean. Lice, for instance, they carry, um, it's not tuberculosis, typhus. Yeah, so if you're covered in lice and you don't clean yourself up, you'll get typhus and then it's the end kind of thing, you know. Yeah, don't want to with that one. <laughs> Especially yeah. in the trench, cold. Yeah, dense. it's um, well. I, I, you know, when you do prolonged, you know, you guys from Vietnam will understand this. Your veterans, when you do prolonged patrolling in, in the wet, it doesn't take a day, maybe two days before your 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 feet. The first thing they do is they go incredibly white, and they wrinkle like you've been in the hot tub for too long. But what's happening is because you're losing your your um, circulation down there, your feet are dying. So what you need to do is get those boots off, get those socks off, get those feet dried and get the powder on it and get your friend. Yeah, to to massage your feet. But in the first world war, of course, you've got your boots and your putties all on. You're you're submerged in the filth. And you could be in that field for days upon days upon days without being able to get out of it. And then your foot literally rots off your foot. You know, the flesh rots off the bone. Uh, and, and it's these different these different sides. It's easy to, to say to people, OK, the horror. Yeah, the horror of war is this, is that. But the reality of war is quite different. You imagine some guy who he knows his feet were aching he knows his feet were cold but he can't feel them now so he's he's quite comfortable he's okay uh then he notices when he gets out of the trench he can't quite walk properly and then it's too late because his feet are gone yeah there will be amputations there'll be all of that and it, it still is a modern problem with soldiers in the ukraine at the moment where ukraine and, and russian troops will be fighting there will be trench foot there will be the the old problems yeah because they they don't go away those guys in those water log trains and it's not even spring yet you wait until spring comes and the the ground turns to mush but uh i think the ukraine troops will will fare better than the soviet or they're not soviets are they, than the russian troops yeah yeah and it's, it's after there was um doug anderson uh i had him as a teacher when i went to college and we covered in this class literature of extreme situations uh, uh this novel regeneration i don't know if you've ever heard of it, it yeah 70s 80s and um he one of the most disgusting classes that because he uh similar to a conversation we're having right now <laughs> yeah he gave a much more graphic and disgusting depiction of uh, how your foot rots off and uh, he's he's also a Vietnam veteran and um, and then he talks he gave us these poems after and was talking about uh, the, the life afterwards of World War One veterans who uh, had to live 
in a time where we didn't have the technology or medical knowledge like we have now living as an amputee or somebody's paralyzed from the waist down. Yeah. When I was a kid, uh, I was born in 55. In my local neighborhood, there were still lots of First World War veterans who were disabled, uh, blind. Uh, I remember one guy got an arm missing and uh, he should, you know, do his gardening and do it quite well. And there was other guys who, um, with their respiratory problems because of gas and so on and so forth. It's, 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 I mean, you know, I got a slight wound through the corner of my eye socket here. Uh, I was chasing some terrorists and uh, unfortunately, as I went over a, a big high wall and to come down, a stick went right through the corner of my eye. And uh, if I hadn't have had a modern medic, an army medic there who knew what he, he was doing, I'd have lost my eye straight away. But his quick action, but his knowledge was was the thing. And um, by the time I got to hospital, uh, when they took my eye out again to have a look, the, the surgeons were there, they were waiting, and they they just stitched up the hole and blah, blah, blah. But if you go back just to 1942, the Americans enter the, the Second World War. There was no antibiotics in 1942. Yeah. They'd been invented, yeah, in the, I think, in the 20s and 30s. Um, but they hadn't had the financial backing to turn them into uh, something you could take, yeah? And and it was an American uh, lady doctor. I think it was a lady doctor. And obviously, I haven't got my notes, so I can't remember her name. But it was because of the Pacific Theatre that the Americans suddenly went, hang on a second, we've got to do something here. Look at the infection these guys are getting. And this is, you know, you look at the First World War. So this is uh, what's left of a, a field dressing. But it's what's in the here. There was a glass vial in there. So you've been wounded. You've got to get your um, cotton wool, as we call it, get the glass vial out, out, snap the end and pour the iodine into your wound. And, you know, it's easy to say that. But when you've been hit, when you are hurt, you're shaking like a leaf. Yeah, I was blown up in a, in a, in a terrorist bomb got me. And if you'd have asked me to speak coherently afterwards and to walk upright, I didn't realise I was walking like that. Um, you could never undo that. But 100 years ago, plus, that is what they had. Yeah, and your American Marines and I were Jimmer. They, you know, they were lucky to have the first lots of your antibiotics, which we, of course, take for granted now, don't we? Yeah, yeah. Now it's like something we just consistently take. But you, 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 you know, you, one of your questions was, you know, about Canada and the First World War. Yeah. And, uh, this is a Canadian cat badge from the First World War. They decided not to have all the separate regiments and they will have it as a national thing. And this is where the modern Canadian flag comes from. And you talk to people about the old Canadian flag, the modern Canadian flag. A lot of people are just interested in their, their provincial flag. Like here in Saskatchewan, they have their, their green and yellow provincial flag and you go over to different places. And it's the same in the States. Each state has its flag, has its bird or its fish or whatever. And I sometimes think to myself, stop it. Yeah, we're a nation. Yeah, so Britain is being divided into Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland and all. And I keep thinking to myself, stop it. If we work together, if we pull together as a nation, we're stronger, we're better. And we can pay homage, of course we can, to our history. But people are becoming more and more divisive. And these guys, you know, these Canadians, I mean, I might be going with a bit of luck in April down to the Meuse-Argonne to see where the Americans fought and do a film about the, the Lost Battalion and that. Because people, they, they just don't know how hard the Yanks fought yeah first world war they just don't know they they see these little bits about this that and the other they don't know about pershing and him you know with the the last minute attacks on the german trenches 
And the last minute, you know, just minutes to go towards the end of the First World War, Americans were mown down by machine guns because they were being forced to charge at the Germans. Yeah. And it was it was just wasted lives, just totally wasted lives. So, you know, when I look at, 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 at Canada's, um, the way they anted up, because they didn't have a choice. They were a dominion. They weren't an independent country from the British. They were a British dominion, part of the empire. So as soon as the Brits go to war, the empire goes to war. That's That was what it was in those days. And the amount of Canadians who simply 1914, they are there. But then when you divide those Canadians up and you have a look at them, many of them are either born in Britain or that first generation Brits who are fighting as Canadians and are proud to do it. And what I what I find is, is that pride is often lost because of the divisions we have in Canada at the moment. You've got so many faction groups who are trying to get you know, recompense for this or recognition for that. And you're thinking to yourself, hold on a second. Each time you do this, there is a day for this group, a day for that group. There's a week for this group, you know, this history week and that. Yeah. When it comes to the guys who fought and died in the First World War, the guys who fought and died in the Second World War, then everything else since, it narrows it down to maybe one day and maybe maybe for a few minutes around 11 o'clock. And I, I talked to one or two veterans about this. And, uh, you know, some veterans have even stopped going to the Legion. Yeah, they've, they've just stopped going. I've got one guy next door. He was in Bosnia. He doesn't want anything to do with it all. And he's, his answer to me when I was talking to him about things, he says, people in Canada don't care. Just that one day, they'll fly the flag and then everybody they just don't care. And my my grandson, my step-grandson, in fact, is in the Canadian Army. He doesn't tell anybody he's in the Army mm. because there's no pride there. And then when I was, I was lecturing to a group of students uh, here in my local town, and I said, are any of you going to join the Canadian Armed Forces? Oh, good Lord, no. Why would we want to do that? And I looked at him, I said, well, you're going to serve your country. Why? Why should we do that? I said, do you ever thought of giving something back? And they, they couldn't understand the concept of serving. Yeah, the pride of it. And then I said to them, I said, well, what do you want to do when you leave school? You know, when you finish with your education? I'm thinking of, of becoming a, um, a paramedic. I said, you could do that in the army. What do you mean? I said, you could go to, you know, in, join the Canadian army. And you could become a top line paramedic and it would all be paid for in the army. Yeah. Really? I said, you could become an aircraft mechanic, a top mechanic in the in the in the Air Force, you know. And they're looking at me as if I'm mad. And then afterwards, they said, I didn't know that. And what what it seems to be is all all these guys here, yeah, who fought to, I suppose, to make Canada part of the world both in the First and the Second World War, if they could be alive now and listen to people, they would shake their heads. Yeah? And it's, it's, a, it's a sad reality, isn't it? People, you know, old Kennedy, what was it? Was He says, that, don't think what you can do for yourself, think what you can do for your country kind of thing. Yeah. But we've lost, it. we've lost it, though. And uh, I can feel it both in Britain. I can feel it in America when I go down there. And I can feel it in Canada for, for sure. People are losing their way. You know, um, I when I when I first served with the American Army, and then I got attached to them. I was fiercely proud of of their their heritage. You know, and now the same in Canada. But unfortunately, they they're not always supported by their their company. You you get people come up to you and they go, yeah, thank you for your service, and you, and it catches you by surprise. And and sometimes I stop them and I go, why are you saying that? And uh, they look at you, they say, well, yeah, um, well, you know, thank you for your service. And you think to yourself afterwards, you, say, you have no idea what I did. You have no idea what violence I had to give out or what violence I received. Yeah. yeah. And if you see some homeless guy who is, you know, smoking a joint in the middle of, of Los Angeles, 
and he's got a combat jacket on and somebody recognizes his, he's a Vietnam veteran, do they stop and say to him, hey, guy, thank you for your service? I don't think so, do they? Yeah. You know, but you have to watch out because I can get bitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Understandably so. And yeah, um, yeah I mean, it, it's it's a it's a tough thing, especially when people made the decision, uh, you know, to serve the way they served. And, um, you know, my heart does go out to Vietnam veterans who many of which were drafted and then came back. And there was a whole generation of people at home that would have called them baby killers and. Oh, yeah. I, and other I insults too. like that. And, um, you know, some of them were just, you know, normal people. Uh, myself, I've never been in the armed service uh, of any sort. I mean, I'm always appreciative. Just, um, I think it was two weeks. Yeah, two weeks ago, there was uh, six uh, six gentlemen from the from the Air Force that had came back after being overseas for three months, and um, I didn't want to. I never bring up, <laughs> hey, where were you? What were you doing overseas? Things like that. Um, when I talk to people, I, uh, you know, I just try to keep it small talk, like, hey, welcome back. Thanks for serving. It's, guys, it's hard. It is. When you come back, it, 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 it is hard because one of the problems I had was I'd been away for a long time doing stuff. And I didn't realize I'd become a little bit of an animal. And, you, you know, a lot of your Vietnam vets will understand this. You come back. And you've only got a few minutes to eat. So you grab your spoon and you shovel your food down into your mouth and get rid of it as fast as you can because you might be away within the minute. And I remember on my first leave uh, from this particular operation, and I'm sat there at my dinner table and my parents and my sister are looking at me with their mouths open going. And they basically says, you're eating like an animal. But I didn't belong in their world. I yeah. belonged back there. And that's another thing. You you take, you know, like First World War veterans. They, where could they go? Where could they talk to other veterans? Because civilians couldn't understand. So they didn't talk to anybody about it. And in the Second World War, it was the same. Some of your guys who come back, from instance, from the Battle of the Bulge or from the, you know, the Pacific Theatre, airmen, sailors and soldiers, the same. Who, who do they talk to? Who can understand? And the one thing a soldier or a serviceman needs, or a woman that, in that case, is somebody who can have a crack, have a laugh about, hey, do you remember when we fell down that hole? Not when Jimmy yeah. Smith was blown to pieces. It's, do you remember when we were doing this and we fell down that hole? Or do you remember so-and-so when he pooped himself and all the... But if that people aren't there for you to talk to, you become quieter and quieter. I lost my best friend, bang, gone. And in my mind, I can still see him now. I'm 68 in, in February. We were both, I think, 23. And I can still hear his voice. Mm -hmm. I can still see his eyes. I can see him as if he could walk through that door. But of course, it's a memory that's trapped in here. Yeah. And the only people I can talk to honestly about it without being upset are the guys who were there. But of course, you know, half of them are dead now. And I'm just another old veteran in his world, you know. And uh, like on, on Remembrance Day on the 11th of November, I'd rather be left alone. Thank you very much. Yeah. You know, this, this whole business, First World War, Second World War, and all the other wars that have gone on, often your veterans, you know, just leave me alone. I'll have a scotch. And uh, I'll do my own remembering because for us, I suppose, like the all this stuff I've got here, the guys who who wore it, Remembrance Day is every day. Veterans Day is every day for us, you know. Yeah. And this is really my big message is I, I teach, I suppose you could call it, um, by shooting from the hip. I love to hand the students at our little museum there. We've got a German machine gun, a light machine gun, a G8, and it's really heavy. And I love to put it into people's hands and they go, how did people do it? Well, that way he's no more and no less than a, an M60. Yeah, because we're young and we're fit and we're trained and you simply do it. You know, I'd like, like you look at people and you think, 
I'd like to see you dig a trench and dig it fast because somebody's shooting at you or, you know, that kind of thing. But hey, right, do you want to ask me some more questions because we rab it in on? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so let's try and um, now that we've talked a little bit about remembrance and uh, some of the hardships of war, yeah. um, there's always like some some fun facts or some fun small things here and there that we learn about with war. And um, in your video on uh, the items the British soldier had, I made my own copy of it. Anchor and crown. Oh, crown and anchor. It. Yeah. Yeah, crown and anchor. So yeah, how, that how one here somewhere. Played? It became illegal. There he is. That's yeah. it. I've got it upside down. There it is. Yeah, with your, your corresponding dice. Because this is a way to for somebody to make pennies. But if you're only earning pennies and you've got your your crown and anchor dice. Yeah. Um I I I did this to prove the point. The odds are stacked against you. So if you're a young soldier and you you place a coin on one of the uh one of the symbols and then you throw the dice the um if the if the dice land on your one it's your you know if it's like if you've bet on the crown and it lands on the crown you win a penny but if you keep betting you will lose and that's the way of the game like the old pharaoh game in the west if you can play a couple of rounds then walk away with your pennies <laughs> you're going to be fine but people go, oh, no, that's good. Oh, yeah, come on, we'll have another go. We'll have another go. And uh, so the guy who owns the game will end up eventually with a few pennies more than he started. And the British Army were very aware, you know, a game of cards will very quickly turn into a, a little game. The, the British traditionally didn't play poker, but uh, they did play gambling games. And so gambling in the army was <clears throat> was outlawed. And But when you're bored, when you're fed up and uh, you're in the second line away from the front line for a little while, a quick game of crown and anchor or a quick game of cards, you know, and uh, it's a bit of a relief. But it was a problem because you got soldiers who lost all their wages. They didn't earn much any, anyhow, but they could lose their wages in no time at all. So the, the authorities, those upstairs, uh, deemed it a disgusting the way the way we were but you got it's, it's an interesting thing you and you don't it doesn't matter if you're talking canadian or british here or indeed the united states the officer class are not the working class you know um i met many american officer united states army officer and i thought to myself yeah i'd rather talk to the top sergeant yeah <laughs> Um, and British officers, oh my goodness me, some of them, some of them were good, right? Don't get me wrong. But some of them, you couldn't understand what they said. Hello, how are you? And you think, what did he just say? He said, oh, he said, good morning. Really? Because they don't belong to my world. And you look back to the First World War, you've got upper class people, this class system leading the poor man into war. And... Uh, after the First World War, this was supposed to have been broken. But in the Second World War, it was very similar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's just one of the sad realities of, of the Western culture, isn't it? Yeah. It is. Yeah. Was so, it, uh, wasn't World War I all kicked off over a family feud? It was Queen, Queen Victoria and her husband Albert were quite prolific at having children. And they were quite clever at marrying their children to other uh, royal families throughout Europe. And then uh, the wild card, the Kaiser Wilhelm II, was actually half English, half German or Prussian. He was disabled. He'd had a terrible birth. And he was the uh, he was the crooked card because he listened to his generals. And uh, it, they should never have joined in, but they did. You know, after the assassination of uh, Franz Ferdinand in June 1914, the Austrian, the Germans very quickly sided with the uh, with the Austrians and then were threatened by the Russians and they were threatened by the uh, French. And it got nothing to do with the British or Canadians at this stage. And uh, 
it's interesting that the 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 Kaiser apparently wrote to the King of the Belgians because they were cousins about uh, can I bring some soldiers through your country because uh, I'm going to take out the French and the King of the Belgians Albert says no. So the Germans invaded Belgium, and that's when the Brits came in, because we had an alliance with Belgium to protect them if ever they were invaded. And as soon as the Brits go to protect Belgium, it's nothing to do with the French. We didn't go in to protect the French. We went in to protect the Belgians. And uh, the Canadians come in straight away, um, automatically. And they, you know, they didn't falter. One of the sad realities of the First World War, you look at Australia, New Zealand, all of you know India, all of these different countries, they anted up and they lost for their populations incredible amounts of men. And come the end of the First World War, the last few weeks of the war, there were no Australian soldiers to replace the Australian soldiers who'd been killed. Yet they were literally running out of, of men. And the Canadians, though, all the way up till the fighting at San Quentin, right at the end of the war, were still there. I think 60,000, forgive me if I get it wrong, any Canadian, I think it was 60,000 Canadians died in the First World War. And when you consider that to the population, it, it, it's absolutely incredible. Yeah. You know? And mind you, the Brits, it sickens me when you, you, you see how many Brits died. It's just, you know, uh, over three quarters of a million. And we're only a little country. Yeah. Yeah. But hey, and then you Yanks, you I always call you Yanks. Do 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 That's excuse fine. me. <laughs> I don't want to be um, called a Yankee. <laughs> yeah. They um I mean they I think it was well over two hundred thousand were killed in the First World War. And as I say, forgive me if I'm wrong, because I'm doing this off the top of my head. But one thing the Americans, the USA don't know is before America entered the war, First World War, nineteen seventeen, there was over a million united states citizens serving and fighting in europe already everything from nurses to ambulance drivers to flyers to actual combatants yeah there was many a canadian soldier who's buried under this canadian leaf the maple leaf on his um gravestone but he's actually american hmm. yeah. yeah there was um legends of the fall yeah, that covered it. The very beginning, one of the brothers uh, goes up. No, two. Well, two of the brothers. The one that dies, he's kind of the instigator of it. But he goes up through Canada and serves yeah. the war, and he doesn't come back. No, as so many didn't. So what else have we got? Oh, you you mentioned the Swiss Army knife. Yeah, this I is uh, the history of it. This is the, it's what we call a jackknife, and I think it starts in the navy when every sailor has a knife. And there were different ones. Uh, that one is so stiff, I can't get that out anymore. That's still razor sharp. Um, I think this is an artillery one where you need various parts to arm the shell. But they started long before the First World War. And uh, it was then realized that every soldier needs one because he needs to be able to do this, that and the other. And that lanyard went around your waist and that tucked into your pocket. And you can always find these out in no man's land rusting away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, when the soldier's blown to pieces, this will be blown out of his pocket kind of thing. But it is uh, it is like the Swiss Army knife. Yeah, but it's it's way back in the Victorian times. Yeah. You give a soldier a can of food, he needs a can opener. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and of course we hadn't got the lovely can openers that we had in the 70s and 80s those little things yeah 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 um yeah there there was a number of fascinating inventions made at that time um do, do you have a uh, a favorite item to talk about uh, talk about or present that or well, it's uh what i like to do is uh, this is a tool uh, the soldiers see it goes down to people go you know about the war and they go what's your favorite or what you like to show none of it is for killing yeah um and this is a a wash roll for a soldier that's a flannel from the first world war right 
a face cloth made of wool. When this gets wet, it stretches and it takes forever to dry, but it's what they had. And then when you open it up, there is a tin opener, knife, fork and spoon, but most importantly, that's a First World War toothbrush made of bone and hog bristle. But they didn't have toothpaste. What do they have instead? Tooth powder. Tooth powder. So and that's never like been opened. Powder and put it on yeah. your mouth. Now, when I was a kid, there was still tooth powder was still used quite widely. Yeah. And this is this is, you know, the favorite bits of mine is to, is to show people the personal touch. They used to collect other regiments cap badges and put them on a belt traditionally these were called hate belts yeah but in fact they're just souvenir belts if you're serving next to a regiment you swap a cap badge but it started off when in Portsmouth or wherever you were you might be next to a regiment you fight him and you beat him you steal his cap badge yeah and you put it on your uh on your belt as and it was they were nicknamed the hate belt but in fact it's just a souvenir belt but okay. you, we've got one in the museum yeah where okay. somebody so, so these are all so these are just badges like you trade or collect or yeah that was your like souvenir regimental cap badges off there off their uh helmet yeah okay. it's probably my favorite probably one of my favorite things to talk about in history is uh symbols right where are you oh he's right the way there that's the uh, the Gloucestershire Regiment, yeah, and their honour is because they fought out in Egypt, and um, but they have a little cap badge on the back because they it won battle, they fought back to back almost to the last man, and the the enemy the French were horrified <laughs> that they couldn't beat this regiment. That's my great grandfather's cap badge, and uh, it's rifles, the crosses, the rifles. And then it has the the battle honors. Let's see if there's any more where you can easily see what they are. That's a machine gunner. Mm -hmm. And this one's a really a rare one. That's uh, the Herefordshire Regiment. It was so small, it was just a battalion strength. But that's one of the symbols from the county badge. And then you got my regiment, the Royal Warwicks. And that's um, a little antelope from uh, an, an African campaign. So you've got all these different things. And then another one from Egypt, yeah, which is the Lincolnshire Regiment. So, yeah, I've got <clears throat> every cap badge of the British Army in the First World War. <clears throat> and uh, the first cap badge I wore was actually a knot. And it's just the Staffordshire knot. And... Uh, People go, well, why does Staffordshire have a knot? <clears throat> and their regiment was, uh, part of their regiment was captured and they formed, a, a, so I understand, a, tri a tricorn knot, a knot that could hang three people at once. And uh, if they could do that, they were apparently given their freedom. So uh, the Staffordshire knot was born, apparently. But I've actually seen that... Uh, it goes back to the medieval times as well. The triple hangman's knot. <laughs> Hangman's yeah. knot, the free man's knot. Um, yeah. So I'm also, uh, speaking of items, I'm also curious, how did people clean their mess tents if they were cleaned? You just, you. one of the best things you can do is do it in a bit of sand. Sand and water. Just give it a good scrub out and then rinse it out afterwards. Was that something like even even in the seventies people did? I've I've cleaned the the filth out of my mess tin more than once in gravelly sand and then washed it out afterwards. Wow! Because if you've, if you've cooked up, if you've cooked in your mess tin, it's like having a dirty pan from your stove. And now, if you've got all the cleaning stuff to do it, then great. But if you're in the field, you know you, you might have a bit of gauze or something like that. But you've got to remember, you've got to keep that kind of thing for your weapon. So just a, a bit of soil in there with a bit of gravel, then wash it all out afterwards and it's clean. Wow. Didn't know that. Yeah. 
All right. So I think um, uh, my second to last question is uh, the, the legacy of World War One. Is there anything you think people want to walk away with? Just the sad, the sad thing is, is, you know, we have these flags and these little banners which say, you know, lest we forget. But we do forget. And then we'll do war again. And uh, then we'll forget and we'll do war again. And uh, I mean, my son, my eldest son was in Northern Ireland, Bosnia and Afghanistan. And when are we going to stop? But the one thing I I've, I tell students here, and I'll probably get into trouble for it one day, is I always say, don't trust your politician unless he's been to war. And they look at me and I say, well, when you've been to war, you might just stop and question, oh, why am I sending these lads here? You know, you look at Putin, he's never been to war. You know, he can quite happily sit up in the Kremlin, but he's sending people to their deaths. Yeah, but he is he's never done it himself. Yeah. Yeah. And so I I have that thing. Before you vote for a politician, make sure you know exactly who you are voting for. Don't vote for a cause, vote for what you, you think is right. Yeah. Yeah. And is there a message you have for future generations? Pardon? That a message you have for future generations? Yeah, it's that. Don't trust. Go with your heart and your mind combine the two have a think before you step forward have a think and if you're going to be a soldier if you're going to join the armed forces do yourself a favor whether it's army air force or navy be a good one be a bloody good soldier you know because it's important all right thank you kevin